Welcome, I'm Tracy Smith and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Actor Charles Melton's rise to fame may seem meteoric, but before his role as a husband beleaguered by his childhood affair with his much older wife in the 2023 film May December, he was just another kid who landed in Los Angeles hungry for stardom. With a month's worth of food packed by his mother, set out for Hollywood to try his hand at acting. You came to L.A. with what? $500 in a dream. That's it. <laughs> And a lot of ramen noodles. <laughs> and a lot of ramen noodles, yes. Fast forward to 2023, and Charles Melton's riveting performance as a young man struggling with grown-up problems. Later in the show, Charles Melton on acting alongside his Academy Award-winning co-stars. I know you did an audition with Julianne. Yes. But what was it like to actually launch into this project with these Oscar-winning actors? Were, were you scared? It was magical. It was magical. You know, they are incredible, incredible masters at what they do, icons. And I felt so invigorated by being with them. And they're even better human beings. And I felt so supported and just encouraged to really tell Joe's story and to like let go. Then Connor Knighton takes us inside the 50th annual World of Concrete convention, where all things masonry were on display. It's a festival, right? Uh, this is the Comic-Con for the, for the concrete guys. This is like their grown-up toy store. There are demonstrations to watch, drills of all sorts to play with, a concrete throne to sit on. People make concrete art, take rides on power trowels, all while cutting rebar and cutting deals. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. Actor Charles Melton grew up believing he'd be a professional athlete as an adult. Based on his breakout performance on screen in May, December, though, it's clear he belongs in Hollywood, not in the Hall of Fame for football or basketball. It all made sense after I met Melton and his family in his Kansas hometown. They're a very beloved part of this community. In the film May, December, Julianne Moore and Charles Melton play a married couple with issues. Okay, we all have issues, but they have a few more than most. I'm very sympathetic, but you're starting to upset me. No, you have not been sympathetic. Why can't we talk about it? The movie is said to be loosely inspired by a true story. In suburban Seattle, an admitted child rapist was sentenced this day. Mary Kay Letourneau, a 34-year-old grade school teacher, was sentenced to seven years in prison for having a relationship with one of her underage students, Vili Falau. I did something that I had no right to do. When Letourneau was released in 2004, she and Falau, who was by then 21, got married and raised their two children. For Charles Melton, the role of Joe, the young husband, was both a huge opportunity and a terrifying challenge. For Joe, there's so much weight he's carrying, and it really stems in his soul, just deep, this arrested development. And to help tell the story of a man with the weight of the world on his shoulders. People, they like see me as like a victim. Melton changed the way he walked, and he put on some weight. How many pounds? Close to 40 pounds. Wow, how? Like five guys, triple cheeseburger with bacon, large Cajun fries, two hot dogs, nacho cheese on them. You know, I made the excuse that it was for my, you know, for Joe's story, but really it was for me. <laughs> you liked it. I loved it. <laughs> yes, I did. That transitioned into me going through a baggy clothes era, which I really enjoy. <laughs> Truth is, Melton made his name in anything but baggy clothes. As Reggie Mantle in the TV series Riverdale, he was an athletic high school jock who was lean and sometimes mean. Doesn't it kill you, coach, to watch the Bulldogs lose week after week? Yeah, well, it's not all about winning, Reg. Keep telling yourself that, loser. The real Charles Melton was born in 1991 in Juneau, Alaska. His dad, Phil, was a career army man who met Charles's mother, Suk Young, in her native Korea. 
the family settled for good near Phil Melton's last duty station in Manhattan, Manhattan, Kansas. Charles was a sensitive kid who often wasn't content unless he was holding his mother's hand. My husband called me Charles as a mama's boy because when we're riding road trip, always he got me mommy hand. <laughs> so I'm in the front passenger seat and he's in the back and I have to give him my arm Aww. like this whole maybe five or six hours. And still, I see. Yes, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and he was raised to appreciate his Korean heritage. And it wasn't until I was about 20 when I came to Los Angeles that I learned the term hapa, which is half of something. I did not know what that was. And I think that term, I, I, I would prefer not to say that term anymore. I'm just like, no, I'm Korean American and I'm proud. Moving around that much, was it tough to make friends? Kind of. That's why I fell into sports. What do you think your future was going to be? Oh, I wanted to play in the NFL. That was my dream for 10 years. And he might have had a shot. Melton was a talented player who would train hard and then sneak back into the Manhattan High School Stadium on his own for a little extra practice. I'd jump the fence. I'd come here late at night. No one in sight. I'd lay down. I'd look at the stars. I'd walk around this field and just visualize winning, making certain plays. And I would do that before every football game. Do you think it worked? For the games we won, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he went on to play college ball at Kansas State, got a few modeling gigs, and in 2012, with a month's worth of food packed by his mother, set out for Hollywood to try his hand at acting. You came to L.A. with what? $500 in a dream. That's it. <laughs> and a lot of ramen noodles. <laughs> and a lot of ramen noodles, yes. Fast forward to 2023, and Charles Melton's riveting performance as a young man struggling with grown-up problems. His inspiration, he says, was drawn from a specific moment in his own childhood, when his dad, who was about to ship out for Iraq, told his 11-year-old son that it was time for him to step up. It's still a tough thing for dad to talk about. And so I sat down and I talked to him, told him he's got to be man of the house and everything. You know, and when I reflect back on it, maybe if something would have happened to me, he'd been stuck in that role, trying to be the one where okay. I always plan on. I always plan on coming back, mm -hmm. but you don't want to put that on somebody. But I'm glad he can use that. Mm -hmm. You know, sorry, army guys are giving me a hard time. <laughs> Charles Melton is keeping his family close. They were with him on a lot of the award season red carpets, and they'll stay at his side for what comes next, whenever and whatever that may be. Okay, so let's talk about the future a little bit. So there are a lot of opportunities out there there's, now. There's a few there's a few things that I'm like really excited about that I'm looking at that I just feel so much gratitude. You know, you don't really ever think about what's gonna come next, usually, especially with everything that's going on in my life right now, you know, just staying grounded. Yeah. I think is... You don't want to look too far ahead? I don't want to look too far ahead. I just want to uh, just uh, trust and have faith that the right thing's going to come when it's meant to come. Up next, an exclusive excerpt from my chat with Charles Melton, something you can only see right here on Here Comes the Sun. Stay with us. My takeaway was Whatever I do, do it with purpose. As promised, here's more from my interview with Charles Melton. Let's talk about May, December first. When you first heard about the part, yes. what did you think? I was kind of blown away. I mean, I had the script sent to me with the self tape and I knew that Todd Haynes was directing and that Natalie Portman and Julian Moore were starring in it. So you already knew they were attached? I knew they were attached. Were you a little um, cowed by that, a little nervous about that? I, I, I was a little nervous, but I was really excited that I had the opportunity to try, like to, to, to have a shot. And I felt like I had nothing to lose. And I ended up self-taping for 
a six week process. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think self tape and I think somebody sends me a script, I read it over a few times and then go blah, 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 blah. No. That's it. Yeah. No. no, no, you usually have someone reading with you and I had my cousin reading with me and he helped me self tape, as did my sister and my coaches that I work with. And it was six weeks mm -hmm. of, of what? I think six weeks of just really diving into the psychology of the character. You know, Sammy Birch, the writer of the script, it was so much just to explore. And there were maybe like two week intervals from the first self tape that I sent, then to the next self tape that I sent, to then going to New York City to do the chemistry read with Julie and Natalie. So it was a lot of watching films that inspired me, figuring out the physicality of Joe. I kind of used it as I was, I was discovering my process in real time. Was this the first time that you had to go that deep for a character? I think so. I mean, the script laid out this blueprint that was exciting. There was so much in between the text. And I think knowing that Todd, Julie, and Natalie were attached and Todd was directing, I felt that I had nothing to lose. So I treated it as like some sort of exercise. Like, what do I have to lose? You mentioned that you were a little nervous about Julianne Moore and Natalie Portman. Mm -hmm. Talk about, I know you did an audition with Julianne, yes. but what was it like to actually launch into this project with these Oscar winning actors? Were, were you scared? It was magical. It was magical. You know, they are incredible, incredible masters at what they do, icons. And I felt so invigorated by being with them. And they're even better human beings. And I felt so supported and just encouraged to really tell Joe's story and to like let go. It was really, really great. We had so much fun in between takes. We would hang out. You know, I mean, it was a short window of 23 days, so we became this really intimate, close family with the cast and the crew. So it was very, uh, I learned so much. What'd you learn from them? I learned just work ethic. They're so prepared. They know there's such a light, warm reverence that we had for each other on set and wanting to see everyone win. There's like this excellence that they bring just by how they work. And I really learned to just let go, to really let go and just trust in my work and what I did and to lean into my instincts. I remember I was 23, I moved from New York and I had to come to LA and the money that I saved up slowly started to disappear. I was auditioning a lot. I, I prob I've probably done over 300 auditions. Wow. 300. But my first audition for this, I think it was like a web series or something, it was a pilot. I booked it. That's encouraging. That's encouraging, but that was the first one that I booked. And then the next one I booked was after 150 <laughs> auditions. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. How did you not lose hope? Uh, I think just my family, you know? I would watch inspirational interviews. I remember watching this thing with Oprah Winfrey. My takeaway was, whatever I do, do it with purpose, you know? And you had a lot of odd jobs. A lot of odd jobs. What'd you do? I walked dogs. I walked over 300 dogs in two months. That's a lot of dogs. That's a lot of dogs. So when you booked Riverdale, oh uh, yeah, did you think, what did you think about how long it would last, what the future was like? <sighs> I didn't really think about how long it would last or what the future would be like, but I remember being so excited. When you booked it? When I booked it, because it was the second season, and I know after the first season, it was this huge, uh, it was very popular and everyone knew about it. And I just remember being so excited. And so I just calling my parents and being so happy and just so inspired and motivated. I was like, again, it was a very similar moment to when I got that phone call at the talent convention thing at the Marriott in Salina, Kansas. It's the same feeling. I was like, I made it. I made it. 
You know, I cried. Uh, I called everybody in my family. And for six years, I was on that show. And I learned, I grew up on that show and made lifelong relationships on that show because I spent 10 months out of the year with all those wonderful people, like my family on that show. And yeah, that show really changed my life. Do you see all of this happening by design? Is it luck? Mm. What do you think? Mm. <laughs> it's a deep question, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, by design or luck, I think both maybe in a way. You know, I think a part of our dreams and our hopes and our aspirations can design a future that we have yet to walk into. Up next, a convention for rock stars. Welcome back. At the annual concrete convention, there's something for every fan of the versatile building material, from bricklaying competitions to vendor showcases, and even meet and greets with the biggest rock stars of the concrete world. Here's Connor Knighton. Three, two, one, let's lay some brick! The Spec Mix Bricklayer 500, held each year in Las Vegas, is full of wall-to-wall -wall action. In the main event, Masons are given an hour to lay as many bricks as possible. It is a competition full of trowels and tribulations, and you know what, it's probably better if I just let them hype it up. It's the fastest, most intense show in Las Vegas, and the fans that pack the arena Love the action. It's the Super Bowl of Masonry. If that is indeed the case, then competitor Fred Campbell might be the Tom Brady of Masonry. The elder statesman who's won this contest the most times. The only person out here can beat me is me. If the bricks aren't level, or the mortar thickness isn't exactly right, judges can deduct from the overall total. And there's big money on the line. Over $125,000 in cash and prizes, including a brand new truck, are doled out to the contestants, who typically do this type of work without hundreds of screaming fans cheering them on. For you to come here and have it be so front and center, to be celebrated for it, what's that like? It's awesome. It's very cool. It, it's hard to put into words for me. I mean, last year, I mean, I was happy I won it, but I was just taking it all in. Michael Schlund, a foreman from Wisconsin, is the returning champion. It's definitely a lot to take in, especially since this bricklaying extravaganza is just one small part of a much larger world. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to World of Concrete. Thank you. 60,000 people flock to Las Vegas to attend the World of Concrete convention. World of Concrete is the only event in the entire world dedicated solely to the concrete masonry industry. We've got guys coming in from 120 different countries. We've got over 700,000 square feet of exhibit space, 1,400 manufacturers. And Kevin Thornton is a senior vice president with Informa Markets, who puts on the convention now in its 50th year. It's a festival, right? Uh, this is the Comic-Con for the, for the concrete guys. This is like their grown-up toy store. There are demonstrations to watch, Drills of all sorts to play with, a concrete throne to sit on, people make concrete art, take rides on power trowels, all while cutting rebar and cutting deals. Let's talk about there are concrete courses. There's a high tech component with 3D printing, simulated truck driving, and virtual tool training. Oh, look at that. There we go. And drilled. This year, there was even love in the air. You may kiss your beautiful bride. James, James and Patricia Estrada got married in front of the convention center. Concrete's been my life. I've been married to concrete for most of my life. Now we got a threesome going on. Me and concrete and Patricia. <laughs> but it's hard to imagine there's anyone who's more in love with concrete than Tyler Lay. I love concrete. Lay is a professor at Oklahoma State University and runs a YouTube channel where he shares his concrete enthusiasm. My name is Tyler Lay. I'm a concrete freak. At the convention, Lay has a chance to meet his fans. For someone who's obsessed with concrete, what's it like to be surrounded by so many other people who share that passion? These are my people, baby. They're here because they want to get better. They want to find the latest tools, the latest tricks, the latest materials, the latest knowledge. 
This year, there was a focus on how to reduce concrete's heavy carbon footprint. It has a pretty big impact on CO2 emissions in the world because it's so widely used. Concrete is the second most used commodity on the planet. Isn't that insane? That's What's insane. Number one? number one is water. That's only because wow. water's in concrete, baby, right? <laughs> All right, eight minutes, eight minutes remaining in the contest. Back over at Masonry Madness, Michael Schlund held on to his title as the number one bricklayer, coming in just 22 bricks ahead of Fred Campbell. Two oh. trucks? Where are you, you going to oh. find a place to park the second one? Bigger garage. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he knows how to build one. I'm Tracy Smith. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.